Welcome to Bridging the Gap. I'm your host, Darion Henderson. Thank you so much for joining us. This month on WNBF News, we're highlighting black history here in South Carolina. We began this four-part series here in Conway with the theme of then and now. And with that, we're highlighting the pioneers of the past and also introducing you to also some people who right now are carrying on that torch and doing amazing things in the community. Again, we began here in Conway with Inevitable Boss, the barbershop, the cornerstone of every black community. So I had to come and check out what's going on up here. I'm joined here with the Inevitable Boss, Melvin Singleton. He is the owner, CEO, operator of Inevitable Boss here in Conway and also joined with Congresswoman Amanda Butler. She is the granddaughter of George Butler the infamous barber here in Conway, who was known for some of the freshest cuts. And I want to say thank you all so much for joining me here. Uh, it's, it's going to be a pretty interesting conversation, uh, taking it from then into now and really figuring out how do we keep the black barbership, the cornerstone of the black community, while also pushing it forward and taking us to like the next generation as well. Um, I want to begin uh, talking about uh, George Butler, uh, your grandfather. Uh, tell us a little bit about him. Well, um, the late George Butler, senior, he was a local pastor. Um, he ended up moving to Conway. He was from, his original family is from Toddsville, Branchville, um, some Bucksport. And so he ended up moving into the city limits of Conway and he started a barbershop. Um, he was one of the first black barbershops in downtown Conway. Um, believe it or not, the brick and mortar building is still there. It's under another name, but the building's still there. So it's kind of good to go by and be like, oh, I know that. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's, he's cut hair for years, over 30 years. Um, he had other, two other gentlemen in the shop with him. One of them was Mr. Stanley, whose son is Reverend Covia Stanley. Um, and they worked that barbershop for years. They had a, an amazing clientele. Um, and so he's done that most of his life. He was a pastor, and then he was also a barber. You gotta love that. And just tell us about some, uh, some of the memories you have from back then, going into the barbershop. Pretty sure it was pretty interesting. It's, it's, <laughs> yes, um, it was pretty interesting. Um, because I remember days going to the barbershop um, and staying with my grandfather at the barbershop where mm -hmm. my dad would drop me and my brother off. And of course, my brother would get a haircut and I'm just, you know, I'm just kind of sitting in there looking around, plundering in his stuff. And of course, he'd always be like, stop plundering, stop <laughs> touching stuff. <laughs> um, but it was a fun place to be growing up, you know, um, before the Playstations and Nintendo, I would go to my grandfather's barbershop and kind of hang out with him. So it was pretty cool. Absolutely, absolutely. And Melvin, you used to go to that barbershop, right? Oh, yes, I did. You used to be in there getting a little fade yeah, too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How was it? How was it? Man, back then it was like uh, my mom would wake up in the early, early on the Saturday morning and uh, it would be me and my baby brother and my sister, of course, and we'll ride down Oak Street Road to go to uh, Mr. George Butler. And so we'll walk in there, man. It was like, like she said, three other guys. And uh, Mr. Butler, he was on to the side. We walk in and you see all these tall guys in there. And you be like, man, what are they about doing here? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, and they got chairs. And you see one guy laid back with his head up and uh, uh, getting a little razor. Yeah, with the razor, <laughs> the shaving cream. They don't man. do that no more. No man. <laughs> uh, and uh, like I said, like when you small and you see a bunch of older guys in one building, they tall. It's like a little small place, and uh, the voice echo because they're laughing and joking and stuff. Is like, I mean. It was amazing because at the same time, you not know what's going on, but you learning what's going on. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, Mr. George Butler, like, he just cut out hair and uh, just give me a little fade. And um, it was amazing, man, just laughing. Didn't know what's going on, but you yeah. just, just looking because, like, why he got all the white stuff on his face? And, and, <laughs> why he short the razor like that, you know? And just uh, trying to figure it out. And we know in a black barbershop, I know you were talking about being there all day, but some folks would be all their day with you. Right. <laughs> the way to be that long, right. trying to figure it all out. When you hear Melvin talking about just being in there and being in your granddad's barbershop, what kind of goes through your mind? To be honest with you, I didn't, growing up, I didn't realize the significance of it. Um, because I knew my grandfather was a barber, but that was granddaddy, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then looking back at it, him having one of the only black barbershops downtown Conway during that time, to me is amazing. He was a small business owner. Um, he took care of his family that way and he enjoyed what he did. Um, and so looking back at it, I think that's a great foundation of, you know, 
building blocks and setting that foundation for our family. Grandfather's a business owner. A lot of people can't say that, you know? Um, and then to be downtown um, right. during a time where there were not a lot of minority businesses in downtown Conway. So I think looking back at it, um, it's absolutely amazing. It's something to really be proud of. Mm -hmm. And when you look at it too, you know, a lot of times, you know, our parents, our grandparents, you know, they want to shield us from like the hardships and things of that nature. Did you see any of that? Or how, how did they even overcome those hardships? And to be honest, I never saw that um, because he had his barbershop, he owned his home, um, he owned his car. Um, and so all we saw growing up was him going to the barbershop, working long hours. And I know, oh my gosh, during the summer, um, we didn't have central AC in the barbershop. We didn't, we didn't have no AC. Right, and so I remember, <laughs> but them like not complaining, but mind you, I was in there as a little kid. I remember burning up. Like, oh my God, it's hot. Um, but him working long hours, and that was he had strong work ethic, and that's what was important. That that was what he instilled, I think, in all of us. Him setting that example. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm pretty sure just seeing that was simply amazing. He was essentially a boss. Yeah. A boss. <laughs> he was a boss. <laughs> Speaking of boss, uh, you know, it 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 sounds like I'm pretty sure a lot of things influenced you. Um, starting your business. Seeing that at a young age, was that one of those things? I mean, she talked about, you know, being the only, you know, one of the only black, you know, places to go down in, in downtown Conway. Did that influence you as a child? It has because, you know, you have it, was growing up in an area where a lot of men wasn't there. And then we see those guys in that place doing those things. It comes like, wow, if that's what I'm supposed to do, if that's how, uh, I put some care of myself, and when you see it, it kind of influenced you. You're like, you know what? He may not know, but I'm going to pick that from you. I'm going to take that skill from you, and I'm going to carry on. And then when you start moving forward, you be like, pick and put stuff, put stuff together. Then you be like, okay, this feel right. Yeah. It feel right. Is that what went into now owning your own barbershop now? Because now you, you know, when I first started, yeah. for full disclosure, yeah. Melvin is also my barber, by the way. I know they came a little late, you know, but um, I know, you know, when I first started going to you, you was in another shop in Conway, just right, right up the street. Um, and almost immediately when, you know, I started going to you, you had, you started just speaking it. Because we also right. know, you know, a lot of um, things that happen, a lot of manifestation comes from speaking it, getting it out, putting it into somebody's ear, because you never know what that person can give you uh, and and not you know more so cash but but knowledge you know you know just being an ear just to listen to um, did 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 that go into starting your business here and 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 get you that 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 next step of like you know what I have an obligation to give back to my community um, and that's what I want to do well first of all uh, I was inspired by a lot of barbers of uh, one of them was Scotty Tuma. You know, uh, Scotty Tuma grew up in the same neighborhood I grew up in, yeah. Michelle Johnson. Uh, then going back, as I got into barbering, you look at Mr. George, and you see how great influence he had, but nobody, back then there wasn't, the light shined on him, yeah. you know? And that growing up being a man, you were like, okay, this feels right. I have to do something more. I gotta do something more. And coming from where we come from, you don't have those, those outlets. So based on you do, when I came up barber, it's like, how can I be influenced to young people of coming from where I come from or just trying to make a way? And so basically it's like when I was getting this barbershop, I said, this barbershop will be, will be an outlet. I will influence whatever I got to do. I'm going I'm to do it. And it, it, it comes as soon as you walk in the door. I remember when uh, he did move over and my first time walking in and I was like, whoa. <laughs> Like, not, I don't know what I was expecting, right. but I just wasn't expecting what I saw when it came from, you know, we talked about it before, the traditional looking barbershops to this barbershop where, you know, you have it so much more modern around here. You know, we were talking also, you know, you know, going to the black barbershop, I'm pretty sure your granddad had it too. That chart, that good old yeah. chart <laughs> with the, the 20 cuts <laughs> where you can be like, I want that one. Not even knowing if somebody in the barbershop could even actually do the cut, but you can pick like, I want that cut or whatever. Um, you don't see that in here, but you see a lot of symbolism 
of yourself. You put a lot of yourself into this, um, which was, is something I really appreciate. Um, there's a lot of elephants around here, right. you know? <laughs> and also, you know, your jersey gets well from when you used to play back in uh, Conway, back in uh, high school as well. We're gonna get to that in a moment about, uh, <laughs> cause I'm sitting here with two great athletes that, I, that they made sure that I knew that they were great athletes in school. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. But um, just talk about what went into pouring yourself when it came to not only getting this shop started, but also the look of the shop as well. Well, first I want to like, even though you see me, you don't see me. It's, it's for the community. Like I say, you know, the elephant came apart one day, you know, like every human being has, they have their hardships. And while I was going through my little hardship and still going through everyday life, smiling and grinning and making sure the people don't feel, or my family don't feel my impact or what I'm going through, uh, I went to sleep. And that night, after I say my prayers, you know, I prayed to the Lord and, um, and I went to sleep and I woke up in my dream, I was still dreaming, and there was an elephant just looking at me. And I was looking up, the elephant grabbed me by the tusk, and then one grabbed me by the trunk. But one of the tusks was broken off. And then it was like, I got you, don't worry. You know, and when I woke up that morning, I said, you know what, that was my spiritual animal. You know, I'm a spiritual person. That was God letting me know, that no matter what I go through, it's gonna be all right. You know what I'm saying? So uh, you might see the elephants with the gold, or you might see uh, the elephant with the, the, the spiritual quotes in oh, there. Oh, the elephant ears. Oh, the elephant ears. <laughs> you know, and for this, this painting right here is is one of Miss Wanda, Miss Wanda Gale. Uh, she worked here too as well. But her daughter drew that piece for me uh, uh, a while back, and um, I, I just feel like elephants just. It was just, it was only right. It was just only right to, you know, to place it. Yeah. Good luck, you know, peace, uh, strong, stand still, and you know, you're gonna be all right. Yeah. For everybody, not just for me though, it's for everybody. Yeah. And definitely one of the most dominant uh, animals in the wild as well. So just that, 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 that stance and how elephants even stand firm. And, and everything that they do, um, that's that's inspiring and, to hear. It was just more so important. Like uh, I'm a very spiritual person. Like even though, you know, what that means to me is like you know whatever you do, you know, say so just make sure you're doing it right into the side. You know what I'm saying? Despite what's going on the outside, yeah. you know, you gotta let God use you. Let Him be your light. You know what I'm saying? You walk by faith and not by sight. Because if I walk by faith and walk my sight, I know it's gonna be all right. But if I get off track and stuff, then everything else is gonna fold and you're gonna be a part of your world and your environment. That's the word. Yeah. You know, that is a word. You know, I like <laughs> <laughs> so that's, I'm like, I want everybody to feel like this is ours. Even though I might have the key to it, but this is yours. If you want, this is yours. It's everyone's key as well. For everybody. That's amazing, that's amazing. And of course, you know, when you talk about taking on something of that of that nature. Like I said, I remember talking to you on multiple occasions, you know what I mean? You realize, sitting there, I'm like, oh, am I, am I like a therapist? You know what I mean? <laughs> and I was like on a whole nother job. But it was great hearing it, you know, because it also gave me a moment just to speak life into your situation as well. You know, with me coming out here to South Carolina, that was my first time ever moving out of Missouri from going to college, starting my job and my second job. And it was like, as you were talking, I could just hear that, you know, that, that natural fear that we all get when we're embarking on something of the unknown yeah. and not knowing what's gonna be on the other side. I don't, know what I'm, I don't know where I'm walking or where I'm headed to, but I know I'm headed somewhere. I could just hear that. But I also know, uh, you know, just the challenges that you face with that as well. You know, um, you, you're, you're gonna face them naturally just because it's just life. Um, what's, what's, what's some of the things that you did, you know, that you met that you had to be like, you know what, it's okay, I'm gonna I'm hit this left and I'm gonna go ahead and figure it out, you know? Man, my biggest thing is you have to walk yeah. and do what's right, even though you don't see it. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. And you don't, free, don't be afraid to talk to people and ask people, but watch who you talk to, you know, and ask, you know what I mean? But most of the time, I had I asked my wife, my uh, my fiance, yeah. which was my future wife. Uh, <laughs> but I asked her, and I do a lot of like, and I have some other like stuff I do. Like I pray a lot, you know, with my family, and I ask, and it's just like, you know, you, 
Challenge is real. Yeah. And that's one thing about the barbershop. Like, men, we have to have an outlet. Human beings, whether you're a man, or a man or a woman, you have to have those outlets. If you don't have those outlets, what happens is we're going to crash. The barbershop and the beauty shop um, within the black community, that has been that for a lot of people. Um, and it's funny because you're a barber, but there's sometimes you got to be that listening ear. You got to be that, right. that low-key therapist. You got to be that low-key encourager, you know what I mean? And I think that has been an amazing asset to so many people who, you know, you come in and, you know, if you look good, you feel good. And so right. that has helped a lot of people who may have been down on their luck. Hey, let me go get me a good haircut. Let me go get a fresh retwist. And then, right. you know, it can really change the outlook on how you feel about yourself and how you approach the world. So the barbershop and beauty shop in the black community has been that staple. Something that has been there that will continue to be there. And that, that piece that adds a lot to the community. Yeah, it's everything. Yeah. You know, it's our great debate stage. Yeah. It's the, you know, they always close on Monday, but don't worry, Tuesday come. And we're talking about Sunday night football. You know, I'm, 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 I'm getting one off. So it's, it's literally everything. And, and, and like you said, it was just a place where you, I mean, you meet people, you know, um, you, 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 you just get to know one each other, you know, and, and, and that just makes it better. It just makes for a better community. Um, and it also for the actual barbers themselves, right? I mean, I know we look at a lot of politicians and everything of that nature being like the leaders of our community, but a lot of barbers are as well, you know, that we don't really give them enough credit for being that. You know, right. when you are that counselor, that, that person that's sitting there, um, that means a lot. Yeah, that means a whole lot, that means a whole lot. And, and hearing, you know, um, his process, and, 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 and getting his shop, you know, I'm pretty sure, like even hearing that and knowing that like, your grandfather did it back in like the 90s, it just adds on that extra layer of respect, you know what yeah. I mean, for, for being such of a boss to get that done. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, because I think about, you know, young business owners now and all the things they have to do and, and sometimes a lot of them don't know about having, oh, I got to go down to the city, I got to get my business permit, I have to get my business license and, you know, some people about going to the bank and getting a business loan and things of that nature. Um, and I think back at my grandfather uh, and you know some of our elders, I wonder like, how did y'all just know how to do it? Um, but they made ways and they, I'm sure they prayed as well. My, my grandfather was also a pastor, so I know he did a whole lot of praying uh, before opening his business, but um, it just saw, shows resiliency. Um, and then the, the fact that Melvin comes along and he can keep that tradition going of having successful business owners, um, and successful barbers in the community, I think is, is awesome. It's phenomenal. Absolutely, and you as a, you know, you're a um, councilwoman yes. for, for Conway, so I'm pretty sure you sitting on there, it's all about, not all about it, but it's a, a huge factor in making sure that black ownership and black businesses really excel, yeah. you know, no matter what community you're in, but definitely one where you're sitting on a board to be upon the leadership uh, of that, you know, you, because also you're in a big position as well, you know, when it comes to being a councilwoman as well, you know, that that means a lot also overseeing the the, the city where your grandfather owned a business at. You saying that, Melvin, what kind of goes to your mind? It's amazing. It's amazing, man. It's like, man, just time changing. Everybody just, just is naturally uprooting and doing things that they want to do and the world is changing. People are finding the strength to stand up and taking over diversity. And you know, it's it's not only a black thing, but it's like a culture thing. Period. Where people are just trying to uproot it from financially and going forward and trying to make something positive happen. You know, it's it's tough. It's rough. But as long as we come together as a collective, like I feel like, man, we gonna knock some things loose, man. And one thing I would like to say is like. Man, it's like, I was born in Down Terrace, and this is knowing a handful of group of people that have a successful business. Like Highland Authority, I know some people from Highland Authority that are business owners. You know, I know people off the 65 are business owners. Yeah. You know, uh, all over the Conway that have low income, they are now business owners. So as one of them, man, I'm proud of it. You know, that's why I know the Lord's working. In mysterious ways, man. It's just, just got to be patient, man. And whenever, one thing I noticed when I stepped out, God has somebody here to help me out. And I want to give a special shout out to Chuck Jordan for the Grill Line game. You know, he came in my life when I really need him. And uh, I, I just really want to say thank you, coach. 
Hey, um, that's it. Yeah, like, yeah. And speaking of coaches and things of that nature, I didn't forget about it. I'm like, I, 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 I didn't forget about it. I didn't forget yeah. about it. You know, it's something you have on the wall here, and we're going to show it to the people too. But it's your Conway jersey. Right. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So what was y'all telling me before? Uh, the, the, the two best athletes to come out of Conway, that's what I'm hearing? Uh, we were voted. We've been voted. Yeah, no best athlete for a while okay. um, yeah. and is you know I think about it because we're getting ready to have our 20th class reunion <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I remember That's going back to uh, look at that photo and it was me and boss you know yeah. and we play sports all year oh, round right. <laughs> so right, right. from August to July we were on somebody court somebody film yeah. um, that was a good time we had yeah. fun we had fun I had to see it now I was like what are we doing we're gonna try to influence everybody to be the best yeah and, uh, yeah, man, it's just, it's dope. I think that's when we learn that competitive yeah. edge, right? You know, right, where, yeah. and the thing is, we're not competing against each other. We're just competing in our, against ourselves to be the best version of ourselves. And I think, you know, it's funny because I coach now. And one of the things I tell the girls, I can't teach you heart. You know, you got to have it. And I think even though we came from humble beginnings, you know, I think our drive in athletics and our drive in school is what kind of led us to this point. You know what I mean? If, if he didn't have that drive, on that football court, I don't know if he would have had that same drive in business, you know? So I think those humble beginnings kind of started growing in us, um, building that stamina, building endurance. Yes, yes. And uh, the sports give you that, that teamwork, that leadership. You know, who else you can go out there and, like, they're going to beat you up every play, every play, every play, every play. But then if you do break through, it's rewarding. But if you don't break through, it's still a warning because your team is up around you and you, they'll lift you and you go back to the drawing board and hopefully get back to the game. I mean, I got a couple guys that I still, like we had those debated conversations and man, it's rough, man. Whack. Still get heated like you feel back then? Ooh, man. <laughs> it get, it, yes, it just, I mean, Conway football, Conway sports period from May Day to Play Day is real. It is real, it's like that's how it was. We grew up like this. It will never die. It will never die. Absolutely. That's super cool. So here with two star athletes <laughs> from back then is super cool. Getting back into the barbershop though, uh, we were talking a little bit earlier just about you know having that relationship, talking to your actual barber. Um, how is it now? Because as we know, you know a lot of times like we talked about back then. Even I remember as a child sitting in the barbershop for about two three hours waiting on the cut, right. sitting, waiting, hoping I'm the next person because I don't even know the order. Because there's really, there's really no way to know the order, you know? Um, but still, once again, we're talking about conversations and the debates and things of that nature. That was happening because we were sitting there forever. Now, it's a lot of appointments, right? This time, that time. I have an appointment at two, I'm out by three, you know? Right. It's very transactional in a way. Um, how is that now since, you know, you currently are a barber. Like how, how is that? And how do you try to still bring that old nostalgic feel back of, of talking to each other? Well, a lot of people, a lot of my clients, uh, they'll come in a little earlier. They'll come in a little earlier and hang out for a few minutes before the appointment or, and just to get that extra, that extra stuff off their chest or whatever. <laughs> or they'll, they'll come in extra early and after they leave, they'll probably leave a few minutes later than normal. But, it just the way things are now, you know. It's it's sadly, but that's how we have to keep it. But um, hopefully, we can open up. We can do more, you know. Like let's just let's come together as a meeting and just I don't know. It just we just got to figure out in the barber community to bring that back, you know. But it's still those live conversations, you know. <laughs> you know, your client might sit over here, my client might sit over here, and do like. For that, you know, you got 45 minutes to 30 minutes, you're gonna say what you gotta say, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. Like my son, I have a son who, you know, uh, back when Boss was at Heads Up, you know, I remember going in, my son's getting the haircut, but I go in and just having the ability to talk to the other barbers and laugh, right. and they pick on me, because at one point, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't put up a Christmas tree one year, right. yeah. and all of them, it was, it was funny yeah. because we laughed, it was yeah. a good barbershop vibe, and I wasn't even there for anything, it was my son, yeah. but it's being right. able to go into the barbershop, have a good laugh, right. talk to everybody, so I think it is important that we kind of make sure that stays alive in the barbershop, um, because that's that's part of it. That's, that's part, part of the barbershop. Yeah. How do we do that, though? You know, that's a hard question, but I know it's a huge, a huge side, like, yeah. you know, because how, how do we keep that there? Because 
it's so needed right now, you yeah. know, with, with so much going on around us, being more accessible to each other than ever before. Right. Um, how do we, you know, still let each other know, even in the moment of, of still letting the barbershop be that cornerstone that, listen, you need to talk to somebody, you know, I'm here for you, you know, how do, how do, how do, how do you I know as, as a patron, um, of the barbershop, you know, when I bring my son to, to get his haircuts, I think it's about being intentional. Um, Cause it's easy, it's super easy to come in for your appointment and leave. You know what I mean? And not say nothing, not speak to anybody. Um, so it's about being intentional, like to develop that relationship with your barber, um, to have a conversation to share. You know, even like, let's say, you know, my son goes to sit in boss's chair. I'm like, hey boss, how you doing? What, how was your week? Y'all busy? You know, just being intentional in our conversations and actually caring about one another. Yeah. And that came up uh, and I showed boss the clip from a movie, Soul. I don't know if you watch Soul. The uh, Disney uh, oh, movie, the, the animated the, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, and in there there is a, a scene with uh, the main character, Jimmy Fox, main character, where he goes to the barbershop, um, and he's you know talking about everything about him being in the jazz and everything, and then it gets to a point where he was like, you know, well, you always loved it, you know, being an actual barber. And he was like, actually not. I actually wanted to be a veterinarian, but I had a daughter, stuff happened. Barber school was cheap. I went to be a barber, and now I'm good at that, and I enjoy doing what I do. Um, it got to the end of that scene, essentially, where he ended up leaving, and the character asked him, like, well, why you never told me that? And he was like, well, you didn't ask. Yeah. You never asked me. You didn't ask that simple, you know, you, it, it was always about you um, and not about me. And not that that's bad, because once again, you know, we're, we're used to barbers being kind of like our unofficial counselors. Yeah. But I think we also need to bridge that gap, right? Right, right, Melvin? Like, you know, where we're also asking you, how are you doing? So I wasn't mad whatsoever that he was like asking me about, you know, ownership and, right. you know, things of that nature because, you know, it was creating that, that, that bridge, right. you know, and, and creating that dialogue to where now I know who's cutting my hair. I mean, you're giving me a good fade, but now I know, and maybe it's making him care a little bit more about my fade. <laughs> right, right, right. 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 But as a barber though, once that relationship established with you and the client, for me personally, yeah. it's not just about the haircut. Yeah. Cause if I want to cut your hair, I'll cut your hair and keep it going. Yeah. But for most barbers, yeah. as I know, and like me, uh, it's more than a haircut. Yeah. It's more about, like I say, in, being influenced yeah. that you have on those others that you, you cut in the hair. Sometimes you can just, you might stay, even though a haircut is for like 30 minutes or 40 minutes, you might spend an extra 15 minutes because you like, hey man, I want to get through with two of you. And, I really want to know what's going on. And so, and like reversal, if a client feel like, man, you ain't talking to me, what's wrong, man? You know, they will, you know, come back and give you that same energy you put out. So, so I feel like, you know, it's there, but it's up to the barber to establish that with their client, you know? Absolutely. And once again, the series called, of course, Bridging the Gap. Um, how do you think, uh, to, kind of, to kind of wrap it up here, how do, how do you think, like, what's, what's, what's our next step? How do we continue to bridge this gap? That's, that's the million dollar question. It is. Um, <laughs> it is. I and I a think, dollars for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think engaging in the dialogue, um, encouraging more um, young men to start their own business. Um, and I love the fact that at our school, at ATA, um, there's a barber school where they're training other young barbers. Um, so they have their instructor, Scotty Toomer, um, and he's showing them and he's breathing that culture. Um, and then also making sure that we as a community support each other. Um, it's more than just a barbershop. Right. It's more than just a barbershop. Right. Um, and even though I'm a little biased because um, Boss is my classmate um, and he's my friend, yeah. but it's also making sure we support one another, we encourage one another. Like you said, like it's, Owning your own business is not easy. Um, and so, of course, encouraging young business owners to keep going. Um, I know on behalf of the city, we have people that are there to kind of walk you through, help you get business license, kind of talk you through what you need to do. Um, and then just being supportive of one another, loving on each other, um, supporting community, because I promise you every town, those small businesses are the heart of the town. So it, we want to encourage other small businesses to come up, you know, because I'm pretty sure Boss knows some other young people who are looking up to him. I mean, spending that time to invest in our future. So I think that starts with the dialogue. It starts with supporting and helping one another and setting the example. I really think it's a, it comes from stop looking at a title and start looking at people as who they are and talk to those people because if you talk to someone, you will be very surprised at what that person is trying to accomplish in life. Stop looking at people, oh, he dressed this way, so he gonna be this way. 
or he come from this area, let me treat him this way. Because a lot of people know, a lot of people get mistreated because of the way the situation is. Yeah. You don't know who that person is. And I'm talking to the people because I was that person. You never know where I'm gonna grow up to be. You know what I'm saying? So whenever you run across somebody, treat them with the, us, the most up respect, respect. And smile and do what you can do for them. And if you can't do nothing good for them, just don't even come to them negative. Just leave them alone. Yeah. You know, be, be a flower. This rose, this, this be who you can be, you know? Yeah. Be positive. Be positive. That's what we're going to leave it right there. I mean, there's really no other way to put it, man. Thank you so much, Amanda, for joining us. Thank you so much. Listen, hearing about your late grandfather, George, it was just so great. Thank you so much for sharing it with us, uh, sharing the Conway community and sharing his story as well. And thank you, Boss, too. You, not only for sharing your story, but for the thank fresh you. fades every week, too. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you so much for joining us. Once again, you can find out and have more information on all our Back History Spotlights right here on WNBF. It's every Tuesday of February, starting at 5 a.m. on WNBF News Today.